Hi everyone, welcome back. I am switching gears with this video a little bit to cover some of the basic stuff that I should have covered a long time ago, but thanks to you for leaving a, a lot of messages. Uh, quite a few of you asked me about uh, covering the topic of K-fold cross-validation, especially as it relates to deep learning, which I'll do in one of the upcoming videos. But with this one, I'd like to make sure we are all on the same page when uh, it comes to understanding what K-fold cross-validation is and what the core purpose of this type of uh, cross-validation is. Again, if you want to be notified of this uh, type of videos in future, please hit the subscribe button right now. And also, if you're generous, find the little thank you button right next to the subscribe button and uh, just be generous. Okay, let me jump into this slide deck and no coding today. I'm going to start that uh, starting the next video. And uh, let's build the knowledge in K-fold cross-validation by understanding the core basics and then getting our hands dirty by coding a little bit uh, uh, to understand uh, the traditional deep, not deep learning, the traditional machine learning models like support vector machine random forest. That would be the next video. And the one after that, let's learn how to do uh, some sort of uh, hyperparameter tuning for these traditional models and then for deep learning in the one after that. So I hope you'll find these next three to four videos to be educational and of course useful for your specific uh, research or whatever work that you're trying to do. Jumping in, again on the screen you can see a quick summary of K-fold cross-validation. If you only have a few seconds of your time, this should have given you exactly what the essence of K-fold cross-validation is. Now, uh, Starting with understanding what cross-validation is, well, this is basically from Wikipedia. I looked at many sources, but these guys actually did a great job in summarizing it. It's a resampling method. Again, I'm not talking about K-fold cross-validation, uh, even though the terms can be interchangeably used. Cross-validation itself is a resampling method that uses different portions of your entire data to train a model on different iterations or to train and test a model on different iterations. So you have uh, 100,000 data points and you create a model and you split your, the typical way of doing your uh, model uh, testing is, okay, you have some of your data and you train on it and you have some testing data. But then how sure are you that this model actually works on uh, other types of uh, splits? of your data set, right? So this is the essence of it. And in machine learning, this specific approach can be used, the cross-validation can be used to compare various models and its parameters. So you have a support vector machine, random forest, and within support vector machines and random forest, you have, uh, uh, for example, a uh, different number of splits in random forest. And if you think about deep learning, there are many other hyperparameters, right? So which one is the right one? Uh, the cross-validation can be a good approach in terms of tuning your parameters uh, to identify the best settings and the best model for a given type of problem. And K-fold is a specific way of sampling uh, the data. That's it. And as the name K, I mean, you can probably guess this is similar to K-means. K refers to the number. So in this case, the number of groups that the data gets splits into. So that's what uh, K refers to. Okay, if you have k equals to 10, then your entire data gets split into uh, 10 groups. You know, you have 1,000 data points, you have 10 groups, in each group you have 100 uh, data points. That's it. So that's what k-fold is. And uh, here is another example. Again, this is visual representation of what I just mentioned in the previous slide as text. So you have, let's say, 1,000 data points here, and your k equals to 10 or in this example, your k equals to five, right? One, two, three, four, five data points. So at a time, you have five data points split that gets used for testing data and the remaining whatever, okay, let's say for the sake of simplicity, we have 100 data points. Of those five are used for testing, the remaining 95 are used for training. And in the next iteration, you release the first five that we have used for testing in the previous iteration for uh, for the training purposes and you move on to pick the next set as your uh, testing so by the time you reach to k every data point must have been used as part of your testing and every other data point ha was used as part of your training again we are not training the same model uh, over and over by using all of these we are actually training a given model on this specific data set 
and you get a value, a, a metric, an accuracy metric, for example. You get a validation metric and you keep that metric to the side. And I'll talk about that in a second. But And you train the model again on a different data set and you test it again, yeah? Uh, or on a different split of your data set. So data scaling and normalization, this is a key point, right? So when you do this, when you do your uh, testing and training, you divide your data into, I mean, it's, it's quite common. I have made this mistake quite a few times and so a couple of you pointed it out that I was actually scaling or normalizing the data before doing the split, but please note that. Please make this a habit. Uh, do your scaling and normalization after the split has been made. If you learn one thing from this video series, if this is the one thing, then you're in good shape, yeah? Please learn to split your data first into your training and testing and then perform whatever the scaling, if it is min-max scaler, whatever scaler uh, you're trying to do, do it after the split. Why is this? Because of this data leakage issue. So let's say you have 100 data points that you're using and then you do uh, some sort of a min-max scaler. So your minimum uh, value can be, let's say, uh, uh, one, and your maximum value in this specific split. Uh, I mean, in this data set, the maximum value is, I don't know, 99. And then you do min-max scalar, you kind of divide everything by 99 or so, and then you normalize or scale your values. And then you split. Now your test data, even though the test data may not have values above, let's say, 80, it's normalized to 99 because that was in the original data set. So that information is part of your testing, that information is part of your training, and it can be vice versa. So there is some information about this data that's uh, uh, provided to your training side, right? So you're, uh, th you don't want that. That's exactly what's referred to as data leakage. And to prevent that, you split your data first and if 99 shows up as part of your testing data, so be it. If it shows up as part of your training data, so be it, because you are now normalizing it. And think about the logic behind it. When you're actually, after the training the model, you're applying on new data that it never saw before. And the new data may not be between one and 99. The new data may come with its own limits and you are doing min-max scalar on that new data. So doesn't it make sense for you to scale or normalize on each training uh, uh, data versus on the entire data. So think about it, yeah? Again, this tutorial is not about this data leakage, but again, this is a valuable information that I seriously hope that you keep in mind and I keep in mind because I do this mistake all the time in the excitement of showing you a given process. I'll try to make it a good habit of uh, keeping that in mind. Okay, now what is a good K value? So where do you start with? If you look at any published code or any published paper, most of the time you see that they are using 10. In fact, I put three, five, or 10, but most of the time it is 10, yeah? That, uh, so if you don't know anything, just go ahead and use 10. You can uh, come up with some strategies, I'll just quickly mention about it, but whatever the value that you pick, you have to ensure that there is enough data in both training and testing sets, yeah? And that data is representative. So you have to find a good balance between uh, the number of splits and are you providing a good enough split where you have enough training, representative training and testing data. Now, if you have a lot of data, one way to actually find a good K value is by uh, doing some sort of a sensitivity analysis. Yeah, we have covered this a couple of times in different contexts in the past, but sensitivity analysis is basically in this context, the way you can do is, Let's say you have a specific model. Yeah, it can be uh, a support vector machine with certain param C parameters, certain certain para hyperparameters. Let's say, so that is the model. You run the same model on the same data, but with different k values. You split the data uh, with a k equals to one, k equals to two, k equals to three. Go all the way to k equals to twenty. Of course, it's time consuming if you have lots of data. But if you have small enough data, then this should be easily doable, right? So you do this 20 times and then you plot the accuracy. Now, how do you know what the accuracy is? But, excuse me, well, you actually train the model, the same model on your entire data. 
And let's say, okay, that is your benchmark. And with respect to that, how does different splits actually do? And then plot the performance. And at some point you should see that, okay, uh, after a K value of 10, the performance uh, is not as noisy anymore. So K equals to 10 is the one where it is the least noisy. So let's go ahead and pick that, yeah? So I, I'm giving you a visual representation, I mean, a, a, uh, I'm giving you a, a method via text and hopefully you get an idea visually in your mind. Uh, I'm not going to do that exercise, but that is something you can easily do. Now, if you set your k equals to n, let's say you have 1000 data points and if your k equals to 1000, then only one data point is used for testing, right? So, uh, and this is referred to as leave one out cross validation. This makes sense if your data sets are small. So consider doing this uh, if your data set is small. And uh, just to summarize this entire k fold discussion, if your data set is 500 data points and k equals to 10, then I already mentioned this a couple of times, but it's good to summarize it. Your data gets split into 10 folds, right? 10 different folds. And in each, you have 500 divided by 10, 50 data points. Of those, one fold gets used for testing, or if you want to call it validation. So one fold is used for testing, and the remaining nine are used for training. Yeah, nine is nothing but k minus one, right? So they are used for training. So that's a quick summary. And uh, now the question is, how do we use it in Python? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you tuned uh, into this video trying to learn how to do this. We are going to definitely do this in the next video, but uh, here is a quick summary. In scikit-learn, model selection, you can import this k-fold, and there are many other parameters you can supply, but this is typically how I use it. Uh, within k-fold, I define number of splits and I define a random state. So the experiment is reproducible. That's optional. You don't have to. But to keep your experiment reproducible, go ahead and uh, set a specific random state. Again, watch my video on random is not so random. I forgot exactly the number for that video, but just search uh, for that video in my channel if you want to learn more about random in Python. Okay, and I usually uh, set shuffle equals to true because if you have a whole uh, a bunch of data, it initially shuffles and then divides the data into these 10 different folds and it goes one fold uh, by one fold. There is another uh, incarnation or implementation of k-fold that's called stratified k-fold and as the name suggests it's uh, it, it uh, maybe the name doesn't suggest anything but what it does is uh, it, it anyway it's very useful if your data is imbalanced for example in your if you have two class problem and in one class you have like 70% of the data belongs to one class and the 30% of the data uh, belongs to a, another class, then probably for your testing purposes and training purposes, it makes sense if you divide the data such a way that in your training set, you have the same split, 70% of one class and 30% of the other, right? So if you randomly divide them, then you, your balance is off. And in some cases you may want that, but uh, stratified k-fold actually gives you a, uh, a proportional split when you divide your data into testing and training. If your original data is imbalanced, that gets reflected in these testing and training data sets. Uh, and cross-validation, again, can be performed two different ways. One, we can deliberately uh, iterate over training and testing. So for example, you say, okay, I want to divide this into n splits, like you have 10 splits and uh, and uh, uh, you can you can go through, okay, for train and test, like for, for each split, okay, give me the training and testing data. And then you train the model on each fold within that for loop. And then you evaluate the model and then you spit out what the accuracy is. And you repeat this for all of the 10 splits and uh, once you do that, typically you average the, the accuracy and then it tells you how good your model is performing for that specific data over k folds. Yeah? That's the typical way, but uh, if all you're after is the cross-validation score, like accuracy, the mean accuracy, or accuracy for each of these folds, then you don't have to deliberately uh, write your for loop. You can actually use, within scikit-learn, you can use cross-val score. Okay, and it computes the cross-validation score, like it says, 
by doing all of that. And all you need to do uh, to run that is to supply the model. Okay, this is my SVM or random forest. We'll also learn how to do it with deep learning later on, like a neural network and your, imp uh, your X and Y data that gets split into how many of our folds you pr uh, specify here. Yeah. So uh, in this example, CV equals to 10. And then you have to tell what the score, you don't have to, it uses default. I think it's also accuracy, the default. But in this example, I'm saying, okay, my scoring equals to accuracy. So when it reports, uh, evaluates the model, it's evaluating based on the accuracy. And then uh, uh, number of jobs, again, this is if you want a parallel process. You need to be careful if you are doing n jobs equals to minus for one. Uh, for certain certain models. Uh, again, maybe we'll run into that issue while we're uh, doing the coding part. But this is how we implement this in uh, Python. So uh, one other note, so just to summarize this entire, entire discussion, so you have your all data that gets split into training and test data, but we don't, uh, we don't want only the training and test data, we want k-fold, right? So in this example, we have five-fold. So we divide this into uh, five different bins, five different folds, and for each fold, we are training a model on fold two, three, four, five right here, and testing the model using this fold one test data set right there, and you get some sort of a uh, metric. Yeah, accuracy metric or your evaluation metric. And you do the same for each of your iterations and then you just go ahead and take this and then you mean the score uh, performance. That tells you how well the model is doing and maybe you tune the parameters and you do it multiple times and you're like, okay, if these are the parameters for this data set, you're getting the best accuracy. And you note down that and repeat the above training process for all the models, like I mentioned uh and uh, hyperparameters to find the best one and then train a different model based on the best one that you identified so in summary the purpose of cave fold validation is to check a model performance but not to develop a final model you're not using cave fold to train a model uh, uh, to get a final model. You're using k-fold to check a model performance and then you're noting down, okay, this is the best parameters or this is the best model that's performing the, uh, well. And then you train that specific model on all the data and so on, yeah? So this is just a model evaluation technique. And uh, use k equals to 10 if you don't know any better. Uh, but typically for small data sets, you uh, use k equals to 10 and k equals to five for large data sets or three. Now, a quick example is you want to pick the best model between, uh, for example, support vector machines, random forest, and neural network. The way you would approach that problem is you perform the k-fold cross-validation, just like I mentioned in my previous slide, like how many of our folds, and identify the one that performs the best. Let's say, okay, uh, random forest is performing the best with a uh, number of splits equals to 20. Yeah, uh, one of the hyperparameters of random, uh, random forest. Then train that specific model, random forest with n equals to 20, with corresponding best performing hyperparameters, n equals to 20 in my example, on all data for future use. So because you're training a model to use it uh, in future for future data sets or other data sets that you have. So you better train that on all data and not just on individual folds. So that is the essence of uh, k-fold. I hope it makes sense. Again, please go ahead and read more. My, my attempt here is to make sure you get uh, started, you understand the concepts a little, and then you can go dig deeper if you have unanswered questions. If you have any other questions, leave that as part of the comments down here, and I'll probably make another video to answer some of these questions if I see a recurring theme. Okay, please stay tuned. In the next video, we are going to get our hands dirty by uh, digging into some code. Believe me, it's pretty easy. Even if you're a beginner, you should be able to easily follow what I'm going to talk about in the next few videos. Okay, thank you guys. See you next week.